This is Times Radio. And unsurprisingly, the Rwanda plan makes the front pages of most of the papers. The Times says the right wing re- rebellion, the <laughs> tongue twister, right wing rebellion that threatens the Rwanda bill. And the Daily Telegraph has the words of Ben Wallace, um, who said, do not let the Rwanda row bring down the government. The Financial Times is talking about the fury um, from some countries, the UK included, the EU, about what's happened at COP28. We'll be finding out more about the very latest from Dubai because it is the last day of the summit. And the, the bill that all the countries are supposed to sort of agree to at the end has been significantly watered down. We'll look at that in, in a bit more detail shortly. In the meantime, Andrew Eborn, barrister, broadcaster, futurist, president of Octopus TV, joins me on the line. Andrew, good morning. Good morning, Rosie. Um, the Daily Mail put it very bluntly. Down to the wire. They say Rishi Sunak was last night battling to prevent a revolt from the Tory right. Do you think the yeah, Prime Minister absolutely. is going to stave them off? Well, it's a really interesting one, isn't it? Uh, down to the wire, dramatic headline chosen by the Daily Mail. Uh, and here he's trying to prevent this revolt on the Tory right from derailing this Rwanda scheme. And it seems as though every time we talk, Rwanda is right front and centre of these sort of things. They tried desperately to make this work after the Supreme Court uh, basically dealt them a very predictable blow by saying it was uh, illegal and they couldn't uh, stop what was going to happen. So um, what happens is Abraham Lincoln, he always used to say, if you call the tail of a dog uh, a leg, uh, how many legs does a dog have? And the answer is still four, because even if you change the name of it, um, it still is a, a tale. And the reality is that, and that's what's going to happen. They're now deeming or hoping to deem that Rwanda is a safe country. Uh, and a few of the great lawyers around have commented on this and say, well, actually, what the lawyers do, what the judges do, is merely ensure that the relevant law is enacted in accordance with government wishes. So if they do manage to change it, then that's what the law, lawyers will do. And uh, then eventually you'll sort of try to see this happening. Uh, but it is a complete mess for Rishi. And what's interesting, I always like Matt cartoons. He sort of says a, a glass of mulled wine is like a Tory leadership contest. Another one is never a good idea, uh, which sort of encapsulates the whole thing on that sort of basis. Yeah. And, but what's also interesting, uh, sorry, Roseanne, what's also interesting, I was going to say, is, is, the, is the view that um, a previous prime minister has had, which he, he, he eloquently points out in uh, The Times, and William Hague is sort of warning against people not sort of supporting the prime minister. And he talks about in history, say, look, the heaviest defeat of the Conservatives in the 20th century was not in 1997, but in 1906, after a long period of government was ended by rows over free trade. And some MPs wanted more free trade, others wanting tariffs, and a pragmatic middle position rendered uh, untenable. And what happened is the party literally gave up and chose to go into opposition. And William Hague eloquently explains how miserable opposition is. He does. I mean, he opens his comment piece in The Times by saying... I am the only person alive who knows what it's like to lead the Conservative Party when it's ejected from government and forms the opposition, and I wouldn't wish it on anybody. He's basically saying, you need to prioritise a functioning government, and that's not what they're doing. He says it's easy to see how a political tug of war between groups of MPs can get going over the contents of the bill. They need to know they are pushing and pulling on the edge of a cliff. And do you think this could unpick everything for Rishi Sunak? I, I, I think it really, he's had a miserable, he is having a miserable day, and it's only Tuesday. I mean, he's got the COVID inquiry to deal with and all the sort of headlines on that as well. Um, it, it could, but I, I think, as I say, I, it would be crazy to have another leadership election. Uh, every single time the five-point plan, there's always five to make it exciting for people, uh, it, it comes back to bite him. But stopping the boats is one of those uh, which he needs to sort of make, make sure something happens. But it's been horrible, and the amount of money that's been wasted on trying to uh, do this is that provides journalists every single day. The media is bursting a blood vessel <laughs> every time Rwanda's mentioned, uh, whether it's the, the, the cost it's going to be, the number of people there, and so on and so forth. I went, interestingly, to the World Travel Fair, as I go to these a number of different things, in at the Excel Centre, and one of the glorious stands there, basically people promoting their countries around the world. And Rwanda had a stand there uh, saying how glorious uh, it was to go there. So uh, very interesting from a sort of PR 
point of view. But uh, Rishi certainly needs his PR help at the moment. Uh, and it's going to be a very interesting uh, week uh, for him. Well, how do you think he fared yesterday? He really defended the eat out to help out scheme that obviously he sort of uh, was the architect of and said, look, the scientists had a month pretty much to raise their concerns and they didn't. I'm um, looking inside the paper now. He said, look, the, the scheme was the right thing to do. No, I, absolutely. And I, I watched uh, some of his testimony and, uh, and I thought the, uh, um, the, the presiding uh, the chair was, was very kind to him and said, don't sort of uh, criticise the way that he's giving his evidence and so on and so forth. And um, I felt a little bit sorry for him, but there's maybe not the emotion he wants to have. But he absolutely, that's what he was saying yesterday. He insisted that eat out to help out was the right thing to do. Uh, and you have to put this into context. It's not just the health of the nation, but also the wealth of the nation. And what was happening were these devastating job losses. But it's a really strange thing on one hand, to I would say, look, we followed the science. And, and then on the other hand, I say, well, they, we didn't even consult the science advisors, but they, they've got ad, ample opportunity to raise concerns and they've got it. But the language from his own people uh, is quite extraordinary. Professor Sir Chris Whitty, the chief medical officer for England, he called the scheme eat out to help out the virus is what he said uh, to, to, to um, uh, Johnson's, uh, Boris Johnson's face. Um, but also there are various other people, as, as you said in, your, in the introduction, and, oh, it will promote promotion for uh, later on today. Uh, he was classified and labelled as Dr. Death and mm. so on and so forth. So it, it's a really sort of ugly language. It's not the sort of language that's helpful. But he's sort of trying to explain that this is what happens. Uh, there was a, a hospitality industry in absolute turmoil, losing lots of money. It was trying to encourage people to, to have a look at it. Um, but we need to look at the stats. And um, yeah. there was a, certainly you look at the spikes and so on and so forth as a result of it, although not necessarily across all of the country. And uh, there's various research which is coming out uh, about where the spikes occurred and so on and so forth. Mm. Um, but it seems as though the policy may not have been the right thing to do. Mm, well, and that will be the subject of, of much debate. And obviously, uh, the Prime Minister, then Chancellor, uh, sort of staunchly defending uh, his decisions. Inside uh, the Times, there is uh, news of the Duke of Sussex, uh, Prince Harry, who's been ordered to pay the mail on Sunday more than £48,000 after he sort of tried to force the newspaper to strike out part of its defence in a libel case. Explain to us, with your sort of legal hat on, Andrew, uh, yes. what's happened here and why Harry had to pay this sum? Well, it's, it's very similar. Actually, this is only a little snippet. It's a, a small chapter in, in a very large book uh, of this particular court action. And what it is, he was trying to force the newspaper to strike out part of its defence in the libel case. And what happens is uh, the judge has to determine, it's Mr. Justice Nicklin, uh, who rules over a, a lot of these sort of defamation actions. He has to determine, did the publisher have a real prospect of arguing its case? And if they did, then it would go to trial. Um, so that was the real issue. Is, is there a real prospect of arguing this particular case? And one of the defences in defamation action is that if it contained an honest opinion, um, and that was basically what, what to, to, to happen. So the judge hasn't ruled in the newspaper's favour for the bigger case that will co continue uh, and so on and so forth. It really was on that little minutiae, if you like, about is there a prospect of arguing uh, this particular case, uh, in which case we'll, we'll hear it in the full trial. So it's, it's a, a slightly misleading headline because you think Harry's lost the whole thing. He hasn't. It's still going on. And just to put it into context, what Harry's saying is that uh, it's to do with his security and so on and so forth and, and the head line which said how Prince Harry tried to keep his legal fight with the, the government over a bodyguard secret. Then just minutes after the story broke, his PR machine tried to put positive spin on the dispute. What Harry says uh, uh, is that it was libelous because his honesty and integrity had been attacked. And his lawyers suggested that suggesting that he lied and cynically attempted to mislead public opinion uh, was inaccurate. Um, but what's going to happen is saying the honest defence opinion. complicated, extraordinary. confusing yeah. and expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I think that's certainly right. The, the people who benefit are the, are the lawyers. <laughs> so, so. It, it seems so. Um, front page of the Times this morning. Look, I had three carol services on Sunday. It's kind of my favourite oh, time you. of year. Um, I sing in choirs. I run a community choir. So it's sort of a very exciting moment of time. Apparently, mm. though, uh, when we sing carols, uh, we maybe aren't uh, getting it quite right. This is according to uh, National Heritage. <laughs> they say, hark, carols should be more merry.
Well, I think that's right. I, what, what they say is only a fraction of medieval Christmas carols retain their original score. Uh, and in many instances, it's possible they've never been composed uh, at all, but made up on the spot. Uh, and it's quite extraordinary. They sort of say, look, originally a lot of carols such as Heart the Herald, Angels Sing, uh, are known to have received scores in the 19th century. Um, and, and harmonies and tunes, they, they evolve is the real answer. Uh, and they're even talking about there's one particular one, while uh, shepherds watch their flocks by night, had uh, a wide variety of different musical settings in the 18th century, including gloriously Yorkshire's favourite folk tune on Iltimore Bar Tat. Uh, so we love that sort of stuff. What I also like is that it's a celebration. So they're talking about it's not just the singing, but people are dancing and so on and so forth. And I know you're, you're really passionate about your singing. Do you dance at the same time? Uh, sort of a little bit of movement. <laughs> there's, not, there's not careful choreography. I think some members of my choir would raise more than an eyebrow if I suggested they needed to be dancing. Um, right. But apparently, yeah, some of these carols were sort of made up on the spot, which uh, if you yeah. made up Hark the Herald Angels Sing on the spot, that would be extremely Im impressive. Um, oh, absolutely. <laughs> now, this time of year, whether it's you've been invited to a carol service, carol singing, Christmas party, um, it is that time where things start to feel a bit manic. Well, apparently it is fine to say no if you're invited to the yes. dinner. You're not going to cause any offence. Uh, well, I, I think it is interesting. And it's also uh, the, the, the polite way of saying no. Um, and, and, and lots of people give sort of etiquette guidance on this as well. So in polite ways, like we'd love to come, but we're invited to a black tie event the same night. Um, or the food at your last party wasn't great, so I'll pass. Uh, you can work on those sort of things. <laughs> no one would say... <laughs> the whole idea. Yeah, I think saying to someone you've effectively got a better offer is not great. It's not good. I, I think that's right. I think it's always that, they, that the etiquette will dictate. Absolutely. You should be honest with each other. Uh, but do it in a, in a polite way. So thank you for the invitation, but I regret why I will be unable to attend. Just just keep it polite without offending people. Uh, but I think it is right. I think there's so much pressure on people at this time of year to say, ho, 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 aren't we having fun? And it can be quite miserable, people, uh, if they're forced to have fun. So I, I like the idea of that sort of honesty. I like the idea of why have somebody who's miserable coming to your party. They don't want to be there. You don't really want them to be there, but just kindly extend the invitation. Let's just be more honest this season. Um, and, so, yeah, and the, the research is saying, that um, it's fine to be honest when you're faced with an invitation that you don't feel like accepting, even if it's from a partner or a close friend. And apparently we overestimate how negatively that will go down. And, you know, we've all had times where someone's... It is a bit disappointing if someone cancels on you, especially if it's last minute, but it's much better to, you know, have an honest conversation about it rather than sort of fabricate norovirus or whatever it might be, or having COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would certainly not recommend faking it because what, what happens in, in, in the era of social media, you'll post something of you looking very good at the better invitation party um, and, and therefore it will come back to bite you. Honesty is always the best policy, but polite honesty is, is even better still. Definitely. Final thing, um, inside the times, I, I sort of don't really believe this, Andrew. Flying taxis are going to arrive by 2030, are they? It, it is... It, I think they are. They're looking at it. So air traffic controllers, they've carried out the first live simulation of how these electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, the EV toll, such as taxis, would integrate with existing aircraft. They say it is possible. Um, if you've ever seen anybody on air traffic control, it is such a stressful job. They can only be on for a few few minutes, I understand, and I keep getting revised how many minutes it is. Uh, and then they need to take a break because you see these things, you see over Heathrow, what is it, that every 30 seconds, maybe less now, these things taking off. If you're going to start putting taxis up there uh, as well, it could be an absolute nightmare. And then, of course, you're going to have all the uh, the unlicensed ones. You're going to have uh, um, other people wanting to offer people lifts in these new things. Um, it is going to be interesting. Um, and when we're looking at sort of electric uh, and, uh, cars and, and ways that they self-drive and so on and so forth, um, the technology will come. And as you know, I'm a big, big advocate for this sort of stuff. Um, but it's got some interesting questions, not least how you deal with air traffic control. Andrew, thank you so much. Andrew Eborn, appreciate your time as ever. Barrister, uh, broadcaster and futurist. Brilliant to go through the papers with you. Across the UK, on DAB, online and on your smart speaker, this is Times Radio.